often if you're in a production where there's a lot of you know it's a corporation there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen they micromanage actors to death and you've got you've got a you know staff of nineteen telling you how to say certain lines not only give you giving you line readings but facial gesture readings and you're like back off this is not the way to talk to an actor just leave me alone all the great guys all the biggies they do one thing very consistently Raised in Ottawa and trained in acting at Concordia University and the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, J.C. McKenzie's first big break came when he was cast as Arnold Spivak on the ABC television series Murder One. He's since gone on to make over 150 TV appearances, as well as many films, including Martin Scorsese's The Aviator, The Departed, and The Wolf of Wall Street. We caught up with the busy actor in Los Angeles. So, J.C., I think yeah. in my entire career of interviewing people, I've never had the opportunity to start an interview this way, which is, I knew you when you were a kid. That's right. And, and the only reason I say that is because I used to work for your dad, because he was a pharmacist, and when I was in high school and university, I worked at his pharmacy. At the White Cross dispensary? That's right. We yeah. dispense with accuracy. Was, right. that, the, was that it? No, was that no, the motto? That, that was the one. Just making up your own shit yeah, now? Yeah. Can um, you swear <laughs> on CPAC? Sure. sure. All right. Yeah, it's absolutely okay. Okay. Um, but the reason I say that is uh -huh. because... You came from this family, a pharmacist and a homemaker, and, and all that. Where did the acting thing come from for you? Well, I moved down to New York at a very early age. I was 17 and a half, and I wanted to uh, explore New York City for whatever reasons. I was actually on at the airport in Toronto debating whether I should go to Los Angeles or New York. I had no interest in acting at all. I had never seen a play. I opted for New York. I started exploring the city. I lived at 49th and 6th. You were Radio 17 and a half. 17 and a half. And they yeah. let you, your parents let you go. Yeah, they were pretty cool. I mean, I was a bit of a rebellious bastard. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so my parents, uh, yeah, they, they knew, I guess, the parameters were stretching uh, the older I got. So they let me go down to New York and. Uh, and I, uh, I saw my first play, A Tribute by Bernard Slade, starring Jack Lemmon. I thought it was a movie. I didn't even know that Jack Lemmon was actually in the theater. That's how uh, kind of idiotic I was. But anyway, I saw it, and I had this kind of classic transformational incandescent experience watching this man perform. And I saw men crying, you know, grown men crying in their seats. And, and, I, and I, was, I was utterly altered after that. And then I thought, I may want to teach... Uh, get involved in teaching uh, either drama or English and so I enrolled at Concordia University which is the only university that would take me given my marks at high school Sir John A. MacDonald High School in Ottawa and um, and I just sort of tepidly uh, got into the uh, acting waters I wasn't a performance major Performing is, I, I'm not, I, I really shouldn't act. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm <laughs> not a... What do you mean? Well, I, 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 I really don't have the classic sort of, I, I don't like attention being paid to me, which is, uh, as the cameras <laughs> well, are on see. me right <laughs> yes, now, sir. it's always a good quality in a performer. Okay. Uh, I'm a little shy, and, uh, but, uh, but I did, uh, there, there was something about it when I started doing plays that uh, I really uh, was drawn to, not, I started kind of doing improvisational um, stuff in drama and education, which was the, which was my focus at the time. And so, there was a lot of, um, so it was a lot of spontaneous stuff, and I was drawn to that as well as uh, utter kind of documentary style realism. Uh, that's what I, that's what I love watching, uh, all those great uh, films in the '70s. Uh, you know. So at this point, you're thinking of it more along the lines of why don't I end up teaching as yeah, opposed exactly. to end up performing? Yeah. And then I, um, after two years at Concordia University, I, on a whim, uh, auditioned for the, I uh, took a train down to New York and auditioned for Lambda, London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, and I got in. And that's when I thought, in m that year in London, I thought I might pursue this as a career. I didn't think I'd make a living, nor did anyone else. Yeah. But, but getting in, though, I mean, you, you just, you, you sort of elided over that, but, you know, auditioning for Lambda and getting in, I mean, the audition process must have been for somebody who, as you say, is, doesn't really want attention paid to them, I know that those audition processes can be kind of grueling. 
Yeah, yeah, I didn't expect to get in, so it wasn't really that. Oh, uh, so there was nothing at yeah, stake. Nah, nah, whatever, no pressure. Right. Just, uh, and then I shockingly got in, and then uh, it was very expensive. God bless my father. Uh, you know, we went to a member of parliament to, <laughs> you, know, you know, pathetically get some money to, you know, p help pay for the tuition. I don't know how we expected to do that. Like he was going to give us dough or something. I don't know. <laughs> you went to an MP? Yeah. Do you remember who it was? Yeah, Mitchell Sharp. Who, the, he, who was at one point the, like the uh -huh. head of Treasury Board? He was the finance minister. That's correct. He was a big shot. Yeah. Not for me. I got in the door, and Mitchell said, mm, uh, I, That's not really a profession, is it? <laughs> and I went, Wow, this is going to go well. <laughs> There's no way I'm getting dough off this guy. What, so, the, what were you and your dad thinking of going to Mitchell Sharp? I mean, what was the. I don't know. It's a good question. It is kind of yeah. weird, isn't it? Like, yeah, I, I know. Uh, I you know, I, 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 maybe, I maybe some MP. sort of funding available, right. you know, through through some arts council or something. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, you know, okay. you know, they're wow. heavily subsidized in Canada, or certainly more than the United States. So, uh, but that didn't work. And then my dad, you know, foot the bill. God bless him. And, and then I just had this extraordinary year. I just saw the best. You know, I would see an extraordinary production every night, um, you know, whether it was the National Theater, RSC, uh, Barbican. I mean, there was just one fabulous production after another throughout the year. And that's where I think I learned to act, you know. Uh, you know, we were, they, they told us, we, were, we got into the school because they assumed we could act. It was just, they were giving us the technical tools to kind of, right. um, you know, navigate the classical theater world. But... Uh, but that's not the case. Half the kids couldn't act. I couldn't act. I don't know. You know, it was like... Things like this tend to be, and I, and I know this because I mentioned to you before we started, that my son has this degree in, in drama from Ryerson, and I know that the, that four-year process, which where the numbers of, of uh, young people who are in it gets winnowed down each year mm -hmm. so that you have, mm -hmm. the, you have the actors from Concentrate by, mm -hmm. the, by the time you get to the end. But it's also, it's, a, it's like this hothouse of bonding. I mean, it they're is. acting together, More you ways get really than one. close... Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's not really realistic, though. I mean, we would have teachers address us in small rooms and go around a room and say, you'll make it, you'll make it, you won't make it, you'll make it, you'll make it, you might make it. And I'm like, and they were all wrong. <laughs> they were all wrong. I mean, you know, the, the stars in our theater school uh, who uh, arguably were very talented, just for whatever reasons, couldn't stomach the business and got out quickly. And conversely, you had people that, like me, who weren't expected to make it, that had been at it a good uh, 25, 30 years or whatever. I don't yeah. know how many years yeah. I've been at it, but making a living at it. So, uh, so, yeah. But uh, oh my God, what a yeah, what a what a what a unique and and. Uh, so what did you do after that? What was the next big thing that you, now that you were hooked? I was pretty motivated because I had nowhere to go but up. So I was like, uh, I'm going to organize a cross Canada audition tour. I want people, uh, this is going to sound horrible, to be exposed to, um, you to know, me. Who, uh, yeah, <laughs> to me. To be exposed to me. Yeah, to, <laughs> to be exposed as opposed to, to expose myself to people, yeah, which hey, would get on. you into a lot of trouble. I've done that as well. <laughs> Uh, but uh, and so I set up this tour and I got my first gig after that in Toronto, and then I just started working, man. I just uh, I just didn't stop working, and then I and then I auditioned. Um, you know, I worked for two years straight in Toronto, and then I auditioned. This is all theater stuff. All theater stuff. Yeah. I started getting into TV and film. Uh, you know, my second year, which is cool because uh, I had never done it before, and uh, you know, it's a little daunting at first to have a camera in front of you, but. Uh, but the, everyone was pretty cool, so it was a nice introduction. Uh, and then I auditioned for a, uh, a Neil Simon for the uh, uh, Broadway production of uh, Biloxi Blues. And uh, I was flown down, and uh, I got the role. And I spent a year and a half on tour with six incredible actors, uh, directed by Gene Sachs. Neil Simon was heavily involved. And, uh, and it was the first time I, I, I thought, oh, my god. This, I can't, first of all, I can't believe I'm making money. And, um, you know, it was the style of acting, and it's Neil Simon, so it's a lot of but um -tsh, but it was yeah. the, the comedy came out of the reality of the situation, which I had never really seen before, you know, so it was, it was this transcendent kind of moment I had where I thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. I mean, I want, 
I want to do realistic acting on stage. I had done a lot of sort of presentational stuff. I was at the Shaw Festival, and there were some lovely actors there, but it was, uh, it was all too big and, I don't know, at the time, kind of presentational for me. And so... Uh, but when I you say presentational, what do you mean? Well, you know, it's not, it's not like... My idea of really like good the acting... theater? Yeah, theater. theater? You know, yeah. it's like... Uh, Often done in a British accent, which I, I don't know why. It's just I guess it sounds good. I don't know. You know, it's not set in Britain, but we're speaking in a British accent. That and uh, it, that that would be fine if there was some sort of connection. People listening and talking to one another, like you and I are doing right, right now. This to me is good acting. Yeah, you know, I don't know. It, it, you know, if I, I, it's you know, I've always thought that if I could go by a window and see two people talking, and I just went by. You know, if they're magically on some set or something, that would be classically good acting to me. When you don't notice it, it's just so. That's what I was interested in, and that's what I, that's what I saw down in New York. Uh, you know, I I got involved at the Circle Rep uh, company, Lanford Wilson. You know, Marshall Mason. You know, I had a bunch of stars there like Bill Hurt, you know, William, uh, Jeff Daniels, and um, Timothy Busfield and I, I watched all these guys and they were doing what I wanted to do. So, yeah. so that was a nice, uh, you know, that was a nice school for me. Yeah. Initially coming down to New York after being on this tour for a year and a half. So I think the first time that I was aware that you had gotten into this for a living was when I started watching Murder One. Right. Which was, what years was, was that? 95 to 97. Okay. Yeah. Because you had a recurring role on that. I have a series right yeah. yeah. So was that a big deal when that happened to you? Huge. Yeah. yeah. Bochco at the time was the guy. He was kind of the titan of television. He didn't, you didn't, you auditioned for him, you didn't have to pass network. Normally you have to go through a series of hoops where you jump and, you know, perform like a monkey in front of like uh, these network executives who give you less than two minutes to hit your mark, say your stuff without imploding and get out of the room. So it's very, very difficult and not creative. It's not conducive to any creative experience. So Bochco, you audition for him, he says, yes, this is the guy I want. And, and that was it. That's how much power he had at the time. Wow. Hill Street Blues, you know, uh, L.A. Law, all these, all these shows. So, uh, yeah, that was an unbelievable experience for me, not only because I was a serious regular, but I got to see these, un these great actors like Patricia Clarkson, Stanley Tucci, Dylan Baker, um, Mary McCormick. I mean, it was just on and on. And the guest stars, you know, Richard Schiff came in. I mean, it was just, it was just a, a great experience and though critically it did very well uh, it was paired at the time up against ER which was a juggernaut and I yeah. guess ABC at the time thought they were going to go up against them and win they didn't and uh, we were, we got moved around and then and then ditched after the yeah. after the end of which the which is unfortunate year. because it did sort of break new ground in, in terms of the format of it. Sure. It was an ongoing story it for was an entire the series. First in that yeah. in that in that idea of following one story. Because which these is now, days it'd be perfect. I know. It's like you could stream them all in one gulp. Right? That's right. Yeah. It's the Netflix Netflix uh, formula. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so what did that do for you in terms of opportunities afterwards? Everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, I couldn't get in the door before that, but. I couldn't. I barely got an audition for that. I had to. I knew the casting director, Alexa Fogo. We were friends, and which is always a bad thing. You don't want to be friends with the casting director. They're not going to bring you in. They're going to have soup with you. They don't want. They don't want to see you act. So she never brought me in. But I said, "Listen, uh, please, just let me meet the guy. That's all I want to do." He's, you know, he's a, and she, she, uh, whatever. And then I had a terrible flu, and so I, I'm generally a nervous sort, and I, I just wanted to get back to bed. And so I was pretty relaxed, probably on NyQuil, but, uh, <laughs> which is always a great way to perform. But I, 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 uh, as a result, I, uh, yeah, I just uh, had a good audition. I got the role. So uh, that, uh, in addition to watching these other great, great actors, I got to meet a whole series of really top-notch writers and producers who've gone on to create everything and um, and they have <laughs> they've been my bread and butter in a lot, a lot of these yeah. situations Charles Egley Chick Egley who was one of the executive producers on Murder One um, he's he was the head writer on Dexter he hired me as a series regular on Dark Angel he's now working on this Netflix series which I'm doing called um, uh, Hemlock Grove Space 
Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, it's I right. was going to tell you what it was. Yeah, right thank, away, you. Right. thank you. Thank <laughs> uh, you. So, and uh, yeah, a number of these guys uh, have gone on and, and have remembered me, and uh, uh, I'm not that high maintenance, so they, they hire me. And, uh, yeah. Now, I got to so. ask you about there's this fabulous documentary out there. I don't know how many people have seen it called That Guy Who Was in That Thing. Sure. And you're in it. Yeah. And it's, all, it's, a, it's, it's just interviews with a bunch of guys yeah, 16 who are character actors. recognizable character sure. actors. Sure. And, but most people would go, you know, that guy yeah, was in that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and it was brilliant. It was something I would like to have my son memorize if I could possibly get him to do I it. I think it's a good great uh, yeah, lesson for young actors to watch, yeah. Because in it, you, you're, you're pretty open about how tough it can be. Yeah. And the fact that most people will discourage you from doing it, and that you were discouraged Definitely. by pretty much everybody, uh -huh. except for your folks, I yeah, guess. Yeah, my, my folks are very supportive. Yeah. I mean, as I said, I, I wasn't uh, expected to do much, so... Uh, uh, <laughs> so anything would have been... So anything, yeah. you know, garbage man. <laughs> uh, he, he's great. The guy's great. <laughs> he's doing really well. <laughs> Nothing wrong with garbage men. I like garbage men. <laughs> My God, I'll get the garbage community after me now. But one of the, and it's a big community, by the way. One of the things that you said in that that I thought was so funny was actors are either all gay or they're, cre or they're out of their minds. Yes. Um, and I, I guess maybe that's true, but it's the out of their minds part that I was interested in because why yeah. would you be out of your mind going into this because it's a, a life of rejection? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that. I, when I was at Lambda, I was consulting or talking to a minister I was to, to just happen to be connected to the school there was a church right next to the school and so often I'd go in to you know I don't know just chill out or whatever and I asked him I said I'm a little worried that you know this is going to be more difficult than I thought it's very difficult to make a living and he said get out get out right now you cannot go into it with that mindset or you're not going to succeed mm. or you're not going to be open enough to have any of these experiences so either make the decision and jump in or get out and so I mean that was sage advice so I took it yeah and, and I, I you know you know now I'm I'm like wow I had no game plan you know it's just like after 26 seven years I, I, I had nothing I'm like I, I guess I'll act I don't know I mean what else yeah. am I gonna do yeah, that, that's the only thing I've been trained to do, yeah. I guess. Yeah. You know? uh, so, so it is very, very tough. I think it's tougher now, actually, particularly for kids your son's age. You know, um, it's though though interesting in that kind of the the uh, the template for entertainment has completely changed, and you've got all these new and different uh, specific niches that that are that are being filled and done so well. Um, Money, money has completely altered. Just in terms of, there's no, um, there's often no correlation between you know money and, and certainly um, you know, something that's 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 well thought of. Yeah. And network TV is like, it's very 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 difficult. It's very difficult to get any job right now, even on cable. I mean, I had, I just got a job in HBO, and uh, apparently I had to. They had to go through. I don't know. I don't know how many executives, like 30 executives to, get, had to, to sign off on it. Had to sign off. And it's like, wow, how do you get a gig like that, man? I mean, it's, uh, it's tough. Yeah. Um, so I don't envy uh, young, young actors now, although you can do more interesting work. Uh, you know, I, I think the first play I did was The Lady from Maxime's, and it was this Fado farce done at Theater Plus, directed by Marion Andre. And it was really, really broad. It's a, it's a farce. So I, I was horrified by it because it was just, I, I was like, I, I, I don't want to do this. I don't think I should act, you know? I, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'll be good at this. But then I was cast in summer, Gork, Gorky Summer Folk at Canadian Stage. Um, Eddie Gilbertson directed it. And I had just this l uh, unbelievable experience. And, and then I was back into it. So. Yeah. But... Um, have you done stuff over the course? Well, well, this is it's kind of a dumb question. I realize as, as I'm about to ask it, but I'll ask it anyway. Have you done stuff that you thought, well, okay, I'm just doing this because it's a gig? Absolutely. And, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, often. I mean, listen, you can't be picky. I, I take every job I'm offered yeah. usually until I I'm, until I'm at a point where I don't I don't have to. And people are very fickle, and often they don't know what 
good acting is or whatever somebody has to tell them what good acting is or somebody has to hire you in a you know a classy production for them to to have the balls to i don't know hire you so so it's uh yeah i i i just i just do it all now yeah i don't i don't uh i very rarely turn turn something down i'm you know it's nice i'm being offered stuff now sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't you know often if you're in a production where there's a lot of you know it's a corporation there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen they micromanage actors to death and you've got you've got a you know a staff of 19 telling you how to say certain lines and not only give you giving you line readings but facial gesture readings and you're like back off this is yeah. not the way to talk to an actor just leave me yeah. alone all the great guys all the biggies they do one thing very consistently they leave actors yeah. alone well in fact you've said this about scorsese and you've been in what three of his Four. More, four, okay. Four of his productions. Okay, yeah. and you've, I, I know that you've said that about him, that he knows how to deal with that. He knows how to direct actors. Oh, the guy's amazing. He's amazing. What makes him different? He's the only guy who's working on as large a palette as he's often working on who allows actors to sort of actively dissolve this barrier between documentary and fiction so that it is completely, utterly, uniquely, authentically yours and real. And though there are other act er, directors who are smaller who want to do that, they don't have the kind of skill set that he has, the experience. And he has this, in addition to that, he knows how to tell a narrative through camera work. And so it's a very specific thing that adds buttresses, uh, helps to land moments, create things. He, he, he can psychologically sort of, you know, formulate or do a camera angle to to supplement an emotion which is you know he's really a, a unique guy in terms of acting and being in a room with him you know he's just he's just a he's just a great guy man. you're not micromanaged the way you were talking about not earlier, at all no no in fact I'm expected to bring in my own stuff and he'll he'll and nothing is you know he doesn't he doesn't praise you unnecessarily uh, you know uh, which I would hate I just like you know, it's just, I just want to just want to be honest with somebody. So, but it, it's always positive. It's always, that was good. Let's take that. That was good. Let's use that. That was great. Keep that up. Keep that up. Dad, do more of that. What, whatever you want to do. You make it your own. Yeah. I've, I've been on sets where I'm, the continuity person's coming up and saying, you didn't say, you didn't say the or, uh, or you, you transposed this line. I'm like, are you out of your mind? Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> It doesn't matter, as long as I'm getting the intent across. Listen, I, I'm married to a writer, and we argue about this all the time, because er, er, for her, words are sacrosanct, That's and right. they're meant and to be said, the but the way they're written. I, I don't know. I, I, I can only tell you the way I work. And listen, if I'm in a situation, I play along. Man, I am a complete team player, but I just, I'm telling you what, what I think um, translates into good work. Yeah. But for me, it's just for me. We, just, we did a piece with uh, Colm Fiore, and, and he was. Uh, wow. I was asking him about, about instances where he was confounded by something. And he talked about this one film that he had to do, and Anthony Hopkins was in it with him. And, it was, and there was a scene where I, it, was at, uh, I, it was Titus. Huh? Titus and Dronicus, with the film version of right, Titus sure. and Dronicus, in which he's supposed to, at some point, watch his daughter being raped and decapitated or whatever. And, he, and he's supposed to, and he's, for like f three seconds maybe or seven seconds, he's supposed to react to this, and it's all going to be CGI'd later. And he's asking the director what he's supposed to do, and the director says, well, you know, maybe you could do this and this, and he's just freaking, he doesn't know what to do. So he goes to Hopkins, and Hopkins says, basically, phone it in, don't do anything, just stand there. <laughs> and so he thinks, well, this is kind of risky, but I'll do it. So uh -huh. he does, that's all he does. He, said he just stood there. Uh -huh. And he said, after the film came out and everything, he said, all everybody talked about was that great reaction shot really? of him really nothing. Right. Have you people ever had are projecting any, whatever they exactly. want on, onto yeah. the actor. Yeah. Yeah. Have you Alan had experiences Ar like that? Alan Arkin said the exact same thing. You know, he was in a film, and, and one of the first couple of films, he was like, often I did nothing. And it was, uh, you know, I, I got more response from that because people are sort of projecting whatever they want onto the actor. And as long as you can feel comfortable enough to sit in the material and connect and listen yeah. or whatever, that's half the battle. Yeah. Or more than half the battle. You talk so. about being married to a writer and arguing over things like that, but what about careers? Like, are there when you talked earlier about, well, I take, you know, I take whatever comes along because a gig's a gig. 
Mm -hmm. Does your wife sometimes say, well, what are you doing that for? No, not at all. No? No. Completely she's supportive. She's supportive of Yeah, she's an artist. She was a former actress, so she gets okay. it. She knows. All right. She's a writer. She's in a different position. You know, a lot more people kissing her ass than mine, but you know, <laughs> it's interesting going to a party with her, and I'm like, hello. I'm here. <laughs> Now, I know in that documentary, that guy who was in that thing, you said, we live like hippies. We don't have a kitchen table. We don't no. have a TV. I don't I mean, think that's the case anymore, is it? Or yeah, that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> that's the hey, case, buddy. You're living here in Santa Monica. you got a place in the West Village in New York. Yeah, I think you're I doing mean, a bit better I, than... I, I, but the... But the uh, yeah, but they're small places. They're small places <laughs> in, yeah, just bowl in bowls. both Santa Monica and West, uh -huh. in the West Village. Uh, I don't really need, nor nor have I ever desired much. You know, all my brothers have big homes with, not big homes, but they have homes with picket fences and dogs and, you know, and they cut their lawn. And I've just never been interested in being in the suburbs or, and, and no disrespect, the majority of the people live in the suburbs, but just for me, I'd much rather be around, you know, a diner and homeless people. And that sounds pretentious, but it's not. I, yeah. I, yeah. Maybe but, not. By the time this by the time this airs, which will mm -hmm. be in the summer times, um, oh really? Probably. Yeah. Uh, they'll probably this this thing that you're working on now will probably be out. So I don't want you to like you know blow anything. But mm -hmm. you are working on another HBO series that Scorsese is involved in, right? Yeah, he's the executive producer. And Mick producer. Jagger as well, is Mick Jagger's the yes. executive producer. Yeah. It's very very weird. <laughs> I bet. Very strange. Uh, yeah, Can you talk at all about what it might yeah, be? Yeah, it's called, uh, well, it's right now called the Untitled Rock and Roll Project. It's about a record company in the early 70s and everything that went with, along with music. And you've got Mick Jagger's executive producer. God knows what the, what the music's going to be like. We shot the pilot this summer in New York. Took two months. Scorsese directed it. Terrence Winter is the showrunner. He wrote the script. Terrence Winter wrote The Wolf of Wall Street. He was executive producer and showrunner uh, for Boardwalk Empire, and was one of the head writers on The Sopranos. Yeah. So it's uh, the pedigree is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty lovely. It's the best read through I've ever had with it with a with a cast. I mean, everyone was solid. You know, you just the guy opening the door. Anyway, it, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. And that's that's the hair. I look like uh, as my <laughs> brother said, I look like an ugly porn star. <laughs> or your hair looks like a Japanese gunner's nest. I don't know what that's that pretty meant. obscure. I know. Okay. Uh, so you don't know if this thing will be picked up or not yet. No, I no, guess. it's picked up. It is. So it's it'll picked happen. up. It just doesn't have a title yet. It doesn't have a title. I think it's going to be called Rock and Roll, though, okay. uh, which is not a bad title. Uh, yeah, it was picked up the week before Christmas, so it was a nice gift. And uh, Bobby Cannavale is the lead. Olivia Wilde's in it. Ray Romano is in it. Um, and we we're the there are three partners: myself, Ray, Bobby, and. Uh, P.J. Byrne is uh, one of the other partners too. So, so sounds it, great. Yeah, Jack Quaid's in it. Uh, and are you still doing Hemlock Grove as well? Yeah, I just finished. La well, I just did an episode last week up okay. in Toronto, which where where it was minus twenty four. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It is crazy. I I don't know. I don't know why you live yeah, there. I don't know why, no, either, no, but it's no, too late no, now. Oh no, well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you'll so so you're having a a, yeah, a having bumper a, crop. Yeah, it's not not bad for an older dude. Uh, yeah. And it's tough getting in a room, you know, when you're the older you get. I mean, the guys I see in rooms for episodics, you know, last year, you know, I'd walk into a room and there'd be an Academy Award nominated actor there to audition for a guest lead on an episodic. I'm like, it's not going to me, you know. Yeah. It's amazing, you know, because it windows down. It's like yeah. there's, there's less and less work for, yeah. for actors the older you get. So I am completely... Uh, yeah, indebted and gratified uh, cool. that I'm I'm in the pl place I'm in right now. So. All right. Well, we run short of time. It's been cool, JC. Hey, good buddy. to see you. Yeah, great. Oh, I'm shaking, the, I'm shaking the broken hand. I know. Yeah, I broke my hand on an episode of I don't know some show, <laughs> and, and a guy will re-break it every every three to four months. Thanks for doing it. Thanks for okay. not breaking my hand. Okay.